Okay, before we get started, does anybody need an outline for today? Uh, yeah, Carl, if you want to pass this, the rest of that. These are outlines for today. Um, the title of the outline is God's Chosen Leader is Moses. Um, we're going to do several studies through the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, looking at some principles of leadership, more generally speaking, that we see from the scriptures um, and what, what God's desire and God's design is for leaders uh, before we then turn our focus to talking more specifically about God's pattern for local church organization. Um, so at, at the end of class, don't let me forget, I'm going to... Uh, I think Jared's going to help me hand out the outline for next time we'll move into talking about Joshua. Um, but before we jump into this outline today, let, let, let's go ahead um, and we'll, we'll start with a prayer together. Carl, you still have those outlines? Just put them um, on the back there. Okay, I, I was going to say if, uh, if anybody comes in and needs an outline, if somebody can make sure they, they get them, that would be great. Okay. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and begin with a prayer um, together, if you bow with me. Heavenly Father, uh, you are deserving of all glory and honor and praise. We are so humbled before you as we think about your great majesty, your great power and wisdom, and your great love for us. We thank you so much that you have made it possible for us to have a relationship with you through revealing yourself in the scriptures. Um, through sending your own son to bridge the, the gap between heaven and earth, to uh, be an atoning sacrifice for our sins, to give us an opportunity to be reconciled with you, to have a hope of eternity with you. Lord, we ask that as we study today, you'll open our hearts and minds. You will help us to approach your word uh, ready to be molded and changed. Uh, help us to be nourished and equipped especially as we look at these principles of leadership as you desire it, uh, that we can be developing these qualities in ourselves, uh, that we can be encouraging these qualities in one another, um, and that we as a local congregation can develop into uh, a body that, that has uh, qualified um, and effective shepherds for, for your glory, for the furtherance of, of your work and, and purposes among us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, so we'll start with a little bit of review. Uh, we're, we're going to, uh, here in a moment, be in Exodus 2, uh, but let's review a little bit over what we talked about last time. Um, as I said, in this study, we're, we're going to be looking at some overarching principles of effective leadership, um, as well as getting a clearer picture of the biblical pattern uh, or model for local church leadership. And last time we started by talking about sheep without a shepherd. And you see that phrase used many, many times throughout the scripture. Maybe the time that we're most, most familiar with it is Matthew 9, where Jesus looks out on the people as sheep without a shepherd. Uh, what, what does that phrase describe to us throughout the scripture? What kind of condition are sheep in without shepherds? There's no spiritual leader. Right. Uh, lacking leadership. And what kind of effect does that have on the sheep? It's straight. It's scattered. Many times we see them straying and scattering. Uh, there isn't that, that unifying influence. They're in danger. Vulnerable and danger. Um, they're uh, sometimes uh, fall prey to attack. Um, they're, they're weak, not being provided for and fed the way that they need to be. Um, and have no clear direction, um, no clear guidance. And so uh, we see sometimes that phrase is used because there was no leader. Um, for instance, with King Ahab, um, when Micaiah says, you're, you're going to be killed, says your people are going to be like sheep without a shepherd, and they're all going to go to their own homes because there's nobody to, to lead them any longer. Um, but sometimes you think of Ezekiel 34, were there no shepherds? They're shepherds taking them the wrong way. Exactly. Um, they, they were shepherds serving themselves. Shepherds not effectively fulfilling that role. So sometimes either by the corruption, the selfishness, or the negligence of shepherds, we still end up in that situation. Uh, and so the, the goal here is not simply to appoint people to fulfill the title, right? 
The, the goal is to make sure that we have people genuinely doing that work, uh, of being leaders as God designed it. Um, and so as we've talked about the importance of shepherds, um, and, and we make some application to ourselves, does God want Eastside to be sheep without <coughs> shepherds? No, of course not. That's not part of his design. And uh, do, do we ever see New Testament churches without shepherds? Not, not for very long, but we do see uh, in the uh, beginning stages of churches as they're being established um, that there are cases where there were congregations without shepherds. That's the situation we're in. In Acts chapter 14, you see where Paul uh, and Barnabas went through and established these churches. We're teaching them about the Lord, converting them to the Lord. Um, and then they go back through and they appoint shepherds. Um, you can see there, though, how immediate of a need that, that, is, uh, that is considered and the way that they approach it. That, that very quickly is something that they're addressing. Um, towards the end of our study last time, uh, we briefly mentioned Titus. Uh, Titus chapter 1 and a verse 5. Paul says to Titus, This is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Some versions, the NIV says what was left unfinished. Um, the New King James says things that are lacking. When there are congregations, as it seems was the case here with some of these congregations in Crete, um, that don't have shepherds, something is lacking. Something is left unfinished. Um, and so what we're going to be discussing about church leadership is not theoretical. It is very practical to the needs of this congregation. Uh, and so let's be thinking about it in those terms, um, about developing these qualities ourselves, about helping and supporting others developing these qualities, uh, as well as identifying leaders uh, who uh, we, we, we can't appoint to that role um, to fulfill it effectively. Um, so what we're going to do for the next several studies is look through God's chosen leaders throughout the Old Testament first, and then even getting into focusing on Jesus in his uh, uh, role as a leader um, and how he related with other people. Uh, but we're going to look at Moses today, uh, who is really one of the most well-known and influential leaders of the entire Old Testament. Testament. You, you think about the, you know, the law of Moses. Um, certainly, uh, he had a great impact upon the development of God's people. Um, and so, as we, we think about developing leaders, we're going to start from the very beginning with Moses and see how God prepared him for the role of leader. So, if you want to open your Bibles to Exodus 2, um, and, I, and I'll say I've included more scriptures on this outline than I intend for us to take the time to read in class. I'm counting on you all to, to have read some of these scriptures on your own, um, to have read some of the context on your own, um, so that when we get together, we're able to go ahead and kind of dive into discussing it. Uh, we will go ahead and read Exodus 2 verses 5 through 10 together. Um, would somebody want to volunteer to read that for us? Exodus 2 verse 5 through 10. And Carl, do you have all the mics unmuted? Yeah, okay. Sounds great. Uh, would somebody want to read uh, verses 5 through 10 for us? Okay, Jerome. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, 
I drew him out of the water. Okay. Um, so from this passage, where, where do we see Moses spent his earliest years of life? Well, we are going to see he ends up, at the end of this passage, being taken by Pharaoh's do- daughter. Uh, but where before that? He was actually with his parents. Right, with, with his own mother. Um, it seems until he was weaned, um, she was going to, to nurse him. Uh, we don't know exactly how old he was, but in the ancient world, it was fairly common for children to be weaned around three years old. Um, so probably somewhere around the first three years of life. He's with his own parents. Um, You think about Ruby, you think about Lee, who are, you know, getting close to that point. Uh, But you think about how much a child learns and soaks up at that age. Um, And so Moses, at his very earliest years of life, is being taught and trained by his Hebrew parents with the knowledge that they only have a limited amount of time with him. Um, And so how would that... Uh, have helped mold his heart and character. He gave him the basics, the basis of that Hebrew life, and the, right. the truth of who God is. Yeah, I, I mean, I think about all that Ruby, even at this age, is, is soaking in and learning. Um, I imagine his parents were, were, you know, filling his mind and heart with a lot of things that he might know Jehovah God. Um, especially with the knowledge that they, they were going to be able to have him forever. Um, and so, uh, and, and when he goes to be with Pharaoh's daughter, do you think he, he knows where he's come from? What does she name him? Moses, Moses which means, from the water. right, it, it comes with this idea of drawing him out from the water. His own name is a memory of where he came from. I think some of the, you know, theatrical, like, uh, Prince of Egypt, uh, you know, renditions of this show us that he, he never knew. Well, I, I think from the very uh, outset, he knows who his people are. He knows where he's come from, and, and he grows with that knowledge. Um, at least that, that, that's my understanding here. In, in Acts 7, verse 23, when Stephen recounts this, he says, uh, came into his heart to visit his brethren. He knew who his brethren were. Um, what would the remainder of his childhood education been like, though? He would have had access to all the science, all the knowledge, all the, you name it, uh, that, that Egypt had to offer. Right. Look in Acts 7, 21 and 22. Um, Acts chapter 7, 21 and 22, when Stephen is talking about this, um, it says talking about Moses, and when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. Instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Uh, Egypt is, you know, the the most advanced kingdom of the ancient world. Um, Not only is Moses growing up, you know, in the, the, the best possible place for, for education of the time, but he's growing up in the royal family. Um, you know, he's going to the very best schools, uh, getting the, the best possible education, you know, in language, literature, mathematics, government, public speaking, um, you know, leadership, military tactics, uh, science, architecture, whatever it might be. Um, and so he has this, this foundation of the first few years with his parents, but then he, uh, we're told he was mighty in, in word and indeed um, trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Um, and I think as well, you know, probably the picture that we should have here is he's one of several children that would be part of uh, Pharaoh's household. You know, Pharaoh probably has a, a harem, probably has several children. Um, uh, I, I doubt, you know, with this understanding of where he came from, I doubt he's really in line for the throne at all or anything like that, but, but he's one of several children, um, most likely, in, in this kind of royal household uh, receiving this kind of education um, and certainly would be among the, the respected people of Egypt uh, for that reason. Comments or questions on that, on his early childhood? Rick? Uh, just uh, a kind of a pronoun question. So Exodus 2... Five and six, we see the Pharaoh's daughter 
some maidens who were with her, and one specific woman who went and got this basket. Six says, when she opened it, she saw the child, she had compassion, and apparently whoever just opened it knew that this was a Hebrew child. Which she are we talking about? Did the Pharaoh's daughter know this was a Hebrew child? Did the maiden who opened the basket know it was a Hebrew child? I'm just trying to identify. I'm, I'm not entirely sure on this passage. It's, it's very clear that Pharaoh's daughter is the one who ends up adopting yeah, him, not, not a him. servant. But Someone recognizes this as a Hebrew child. I'm just wondering, did the Pharaoh's daughter know this is a Hebrew child? I, I Certainly, so. yeah, and, and I think part of the reason that he's in the river in a basket to begin with is because the, the Israelites were told to throw their children into the river, right? That, that was part of Pharaoh's edict, um, and so she, she does, <laughs> uh, but, but she puts him in this, this basket. Um, so I, I think it's fairly evident to, to Moses, it's fairly evident to everyone where he's coming from. Well, in verse 7 it says, Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women? Right. So, right. So yeah, to Pharaoh's daughter. Yeah, yeah as well. Definitely. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? Oh, was it Mar Marion, Moses' sister? Yes. Yeah. And so we, we read more about her later as well. Um, but let's go ahead and read Exodus 2, verse 11 through 15. Um, would somebody like to read that for us? 11 through 15. Okay, David. One day when Moses... Oh, this is another David, sorry. Okay. Oh, either way. Yeah, Go ahead, right. David. <laughs> sorry, you, sh you shouldn't sit right next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian feeding a Hebrew of one of his people. Uh, 11 through 15, I'm sorry. And he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Okay. Um, and so th this marks a transition point, uh, one of the major transition points in Moses' life. Uh, we um, can read from Acts 7 that he's 40 years old at this point. So he's, he spent the first 40 years of his life, um, you know, af after the time with his mother, living as an Egyptian, living in Pharaoh's household, being raised and, and trained in that. Um, but now... Uh, what leads Moses to murder this Egyptian? Injustice. Injustice. Yes. Um, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. Uh, we see in Acts 7 um, that he... Uh, uh, let's see. What's the phrase? He's um, uh, Acts 7, 25. Let, let me turn over there because I didn't write down. He chose rather to endure ill treatment. Right. Um, with his people and to enjoy the pleasures. Yes. Uh, Egypt. Right. Choice. Right. In Hebrews 11, we see uh, he um, um, cho chooses to associate himself with his people rather than the Egyptians here. Uh, Acts 7 says it, it came into his heart to visit his brethren. Um and so, what, what do you think is going in his heart that would lead him to this point? Go ahead, David. Sorry, this David. Acts 7.25 says, He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. Right. And so, he, he thinks here that he has a role, he has authority, he has some power that he can use to be helpful. I don't know if he has a grand picture of deliverance here. That, that he's going to be able to, to you know, lead these people out of slavery. But he, he's, he at least sees that he's going to be able to use his influence and use his power to, to lessen the burden upon his people. Um, think about what's going through his mind, though. They're, they're in Exodus 2. It says, Exodus 2, verse 12, He looked this way 
and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Think about what, what has to take place in a person's heart to, to bring them to the point of pre premeditated murder. Um, you know, certainly he, he, he feels like this is justified, like he's able to do something good here. But, but think about how that would affect him and how that would affect his heart, in fact, for, for years to come. I, I don't know if anybody here has read Crime and Punishment, um, but b basically it's the story of somebody who, who commits premeditated murder and then slowly goes out of his mind um, because he's dealing with the guilt of that. You know, I imagine that changes a person. I imagine that that's going to weigh heavily on Moses' heart, and especially what, what ends up happening from this. Um, what was this? Uh, was this the way God intended to deliver the Israelites? It doesn't seem that God directed him to do this. This this had come into his heart. He has this idea that that he, with his power and his influence, is able to take action. Uh, to begin lessening the burdens of, of his people. Um, and this is all ultimately within God's plan, um, but, but certainly this isn't the way that he was going to deliver the Israelites. Uh, and so he kind of rushes out on his own, trying to, to bring this deliverance. Um, and what ends up happening here? Yes, it becomes known, um, and in part because his own people uh, are, are part of spreading the word. Um, and so it's become known. Uh, he knows that he is, uh, his life is in danger, and so he flees and ends up in Midian. Um, you, you imagine he probably looked back on this as the worst mistake in his life. Um, that, uh, you know, for, for years and years, this was the transition point that uh, where, where he left Egypt. And granted, Hebrews 11 shows us, you know, he, he chose to associate with his people instead of Egypt. He, he could have just not cared about his people at all and continued to live uh, with Egypt. He, he did genuinely want to help uh, God's people, but, but I don't think this was his plan, <laughs> that he's going to have to flee. Uh, David, did you have a comment? So Moses is of the tribe of Levi, and <laughs> back in um, Genesis 34, Levi was one of the brothers with Simeon, who after um, Dina was assaulted, took their swords and killed a bunch of people. And then, you know, their father said, that was terrible. Why'd you do that? You caused so much trouble. And when Jacob blesses his sons in Genesis 49, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. For in their anger, they killed men. Hmm. Cursed be their anger. It's fierce. I'll divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And then, of course, we come to Exodus 2, and we see he's a man from the house of Levi. So Moses is soaking up that that Levi anger, as it were, it's just a powerful, mm. powerful avenue that what we learn from our, like a modern day might be, oh, my grandfather would never stand for that. He'd pull out his gun and show them, you know, how much of that generational gets to the little children and shows up and, and our families can have a huge impact on the way our hearts work. That, that could be, certainly. Jerome, did you have a comment as well? Yeah, mine was dealing, uh, more so um, related to the plan of God where, like, providentially, you know, God, no, God doesn't want us to do things like this. However, mm -hmm. the plans for Moses were already set. And I was thinking um, in terms of going later on, in, in, as we see Paul with regard to Stephen, mm -hmm. I'm sure that forever, Paul, this great apostle, always remembered that he was a part of the murder of a great man, of a man filled mm -hmm. with the Holy Spirit, and how that probably... Um, aided him for a long time. Doesn't you know say that, but I, you know that Paul thought about this right. somewhere during his life. However, God continued to use Paul because he had a plan for him. So even within the bad things that we do, ultimately, when we're truly going to be used by God, and only God knows how He's going to use us, mm -hmm. um, it's all a part of the bigger plan. So we can never like totally get. Um, total discouragement or anything when something that we've done uh, wrong is in our minds. We need to move forward because right. God could have punished Moses for, for doing this, right. but, but he didn't. He had, a, he had a bigger plan even and not just happened to be within 
the grand scheme. Right. We, we're only two books into the Bible, and how many times have we seen that happen? You know, with, with Abraham, with yeah, Jacob, Jacob. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with Joseph and his brothers. Uh, constantly, God is using the wrong choices, the sins mm-hmm. of, of his people to, to ultimately, in his mercy, still accomplish his mm-hmm. purposes. So it's no different with Moses here. Um, but certainly, this is going to have a, a deep effect on his, his heart. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I want you to think about Moses now um, as, as he is in the <coughs> wilderness of uh, Midian. Uh, let, let's go ahead and read... Um, uh, Exodus 2, let's read 16 through 22. Um, and David, uh, Lauer, do you want to read that, or do you have another comment real quick? Another thing just to reflect on, uh, again, looking at, at Acts 7, 25, mm-hmm. it says there in that context, he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand. Mm-hmm. He had some perception that God was going to provide salvation for the people. Hmm. So, where would Moses have come up with that first? Um, it, it's not an indication that God had revealed that to him yet. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing that I can think of that he might have been taught as a child was the promises made to Abraham. In Acts, or excuse me, in Genesis 15, mm-hmm. when God said, you know, I'll, I'll send them to another nation and they'll be oppressed there, and then after 400 years, I'll deliver them. Right. Now, if he was taught that as a child, he knows God's going to provide deliverance for his people. Mm-hmm. He may assume, because of his education within Egypt, that's the only thing he knows. Well, it's not the only thing he knows. Mm-hmm. That's the greatest influence. He's 40 years old. He's been here. This is the world he's surrounded with. Right. So he uses the wisdom that he had at the time. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Yeah, and so you're, you're right. He may have had a, uh, a grander view of, of the potential of deliverance there if, if he'd been taught the promises um, to, to Abraham in those early years. Um, uh, and and given the position that, that he's been granted uh, by, by God's mercy, you know, maybe he, he sees himself as the person for that job. Go ahead, Katrina. Uh, David's comment just made me think of Queen Esther when her, you know, uncle says, what if you've brought to the, been brought to the kingdom for a time as this? Like, there right. must be some kind of purpose to your life and to be someone who believes in God and has faith and seeing the oppression of your own people, you know, maybe you are seeking, maybe I'm the person, maybe I'm the one being called by God in this moment. So right. maybe that internal thought. Right. Perhaps you've come to the kingdom for such time as this. That, that would very much apply to, to Moses as well. Patricia? Yeah. Yeah, for sure, we heard about Joseph, how God used Joseph when Joseph was in Egypt, and how he does everything. So I'm sure if his mom, his, his parents, taught him, like, you could be a two, yeah. like, like Joseph was. Right. And he had... Yep. Yeah, there, there'd be a very similar situation to, to Joseph uh, rising up in, in power and, and being a great blessing to God's people. Right at the end of Genesis, Joseph promised his brothers uh, in verse 24 of the last chapter, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up, et cetera, et cetera. And it ties into the promises like other David mentioned. Right, right. So that, that definitely would have been something that, that had been carried for, forward. Uh, how much of that did, did Moses soak in in those first three years? Through his 40 years, did he have other opportunities to kind of be exposed to that? Maybe. Um, you know, but, but definitely, uh, according to Acts 7, he, he had a view um, of, of being able to fulfill a role in delivering God's people. Um, you know, I, I think this, this act of, of murder is him kind of jumping forward on his own, not, not uh, by God's direction. Um, but certainly his, his desire in that Hebrews 11 commends his desire to where he could have just sat back and enjoyed all the riches of Egypt. He instead chooses um, to, to seek the welfare of his people. Um, but this next 40 years is going to have a deep impact on his life as well. And, and I think it's part of God's plan, part of God's intention that he not just get that first 40 years of education and training but that he get this next 40 years. And so let, let's look at that next 40 years. Uh, does somebody want to read Exodus 2, 16 through 22 for us? Uh, Jonathan? 
Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to, to water their father's flock. When then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses <coughs> stood up to stood up and helped them, and watered their flock. And when they said to Ruel, their father, he said, Who is it that have how is it that you have come home so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Where is he? Why is it that you have left him why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to live with the man, and gave and he gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses. And she bore him a son, which he called Gershom, for he said, I have been an I have been a stranger and a foreign land. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, uh, down in chapter 3 and verse 1, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Um, by, by the way, Jethro and Ruul may be the same person. It may be that Ruul is the grandfather and Jethro is the, the father. Um, sometimes when it says the, the daughter, that can apply to a granddaughter. So, uh, but we won't delve too deeply into that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Moses spends the next 40 years of his life out in the wilderness of Midian, evidently working as a shepherd, uh, he's shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro there. Um, but what experience establishes that relationship between Moses and Raul? What, what happened there at the end of Exodus 2 that gets him in contact with this family? It, it's interesting, verse 19, when they're telling their father what, what he's done, Moses, dressed in his Egyptian attire, provides deliverance for Rule's daughter. Right. Can, can you imagine Moses has tried to act as a deliverer towards his people, and it went badly, and it has left a scar on his heart, and, you know, he has had to flee, worst mistake of his life. Um, and now he comes out and God allows him to be able to be a deliverer uh, on a much smaller scale for uh, the, the shepherds. I, I imagine that that would have been very helpful <laughs> in, in Moses' heart and his emotional development to, to uh, be able to, to not have that, that impulse of deliverer squelched in his heart, um, but to have it kind of affirmed here, um, where he's able to, to function as a deliverer. And so he establishes contact. By the way, when we talk about priest of Midian, um, what we're going to find out later, Exodus 18, um, at least by that point, Jethro um, acknowledges Jehovah God as the God of all gods, he says. Um, so he at least has an awareness of Jehovah God, it seems, at, at least by that point, um, and uh, acknowledges his greatness among all the other gods. He, in fact, even uh, seems to officiate in a sacrifice to Jehovah God there in Exodus 18. So even prior to that, is there some knowledge that Jethro has of Jehovah God? Um, to what extent? We really don't know. Um, I'll try not to delve too deeply into questions we don't have the answers to. Uh, but just, just to give us some background uh, and some possibilities for, for his awareness of Jehovah God as, as some sort of priest. Um, obviously, he's outside of the covenant people of Israel. Moses' sons are not circumcised. Um, and so... Uh, that, uh, but there may be some awareness of Jehovah God there. Um, so what kind of experience during this time of his life, this 40 years of his life, might have been helpful in equipping Moses to lead God's people? Why, why doesn't God just take him at 40 years old and go ahead and let him be the deliverer? Why this 40 years? You know, when he was in Egypt, he was powerful in word and deed. Now he stands before the burning bush and he can't speak so good. He was humble. <laughs> And, and I think, just like with Joseph, Joseph was a proud man until God sent him to Egypt, and then he became humble. Right. I, I think God can use us when we're humble, not when we're great. Right. I, I, I think, to some extent, this is 40 years of humbling. Um, 
You, as well, do you remember back in Genesis when the people of Israel first come down to Egypt? Joseph tells the uh, tells Judah and his brothers, "Don't tell Pharaoh that you're shepherds." Why? Because shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. Jo uh, Moses has spent forty years in Egypt, and now what is he doing? <coughs> He's a shepherd out in the wilderness. <laughs> you know, he from his vantage point, he has gone from the highest to the lowest. Um, how else might have this experience been helpful? So, so it certainly is humbling him. Um, he he is no longer trusting his own power, his own capability to be able to do those kind of things. Go ahead. Debbie. He's getting a lot of experience being in the wilderness and knowing how to survive and knowing the area where the water is and things like that. So. Right. He, he spends time in the wilderness. He's, he's going to be in this same wilderness for another, you know, 40 years uh, with the, the people of God. Um, and so this, this 40 years, he's at least in the region of Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, uh, that general area. Uh, so definitely that, that would be a helpful experience for, for him. He's also learning what it's like to live a life dedicated to protection and service of something other than himself. Right. Yeah. He is shepherding a flock in the wilderness for 40 years. What's he going to do for the next 40 years? Shepherd a flock in the wilderness. Um, you know, and uh, a flock that is very needy and, uh, you know, not too smart a lot of times. You know, that, that that's very much a picture of, of the role that, that he will uh, take on later. Um, so I think there's a lot of helpful ways that, that God has not only trained him through education, uh, but now through experience, um, and specifically through the humility that comes through experience. Um, other comments or questions uh, there? David Mock? Again to uh, Exodus 2.19 there, it talks about the deliverance, but also, uh, Kathy was reminding me here, also he drew water for the flock mm -hmm. of rule's daughters. So he didn't just protect them from the other shepherds that were, that were abusive, mm -hmm. but he provided for the flock. Right. And uh, and I think part of what you're getting at here and part of the comment that, that Joe was making earlier, at the time that God calls him and sends him back to Egypt, he sends him with the shepherd's staff, not with a sword. Right, right, definitely. Yeah, so that, that work of, of protecting, that work of providing, um, all, all those things that we talked about. Uh, in fact, later on, when Moses uh, looks to the Lord to, to um, appoint Joshua in his place, that's one of the places that we see that phrase, let, let the people of Israel not be a sheep without a shepherd. Um, so that's very much the role that, that Moses is going to fulfill. Um, let, let's go ahead and look at uh, Exodus 3 and God's, uh, God's commission to Moses. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read this. We're going to read Exodus 3, verse 2 through 12. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I, will I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. 
and shall serve God on this mountain. Okay, there, there's a lot more in this chapter that we could read. Uh, like I said, please, please read through that on your own uh, at, at uh, home. But, but let's just, with, with what we've seen here, talk for a moment. He spent 40 years, we, we can learn that from Acts 7. Uh, this is another 40-year period of his life. Um, in the wilderness, shepherding these sheep, um, fully expecting that that's where he's going to spend the rest of his life, it seems. Um, how does God appear to him? How does God, out of all the ways that God could have chosen to appear to Moses, how does God choose to appear to him? Burning bush that isn't burning. Yes. It isn't consumed. What, what message is that sending to Moses? Maybe a couple different things here. But, but why does God choose to use a bush that is burning and yet not being consumed? Yeah, he has control over everything. Well, Certainly showing his power. Trial by fire. Okay. Refining. Refining by fire. Uh, maybe that's something that would relate to, to Moses and, and what he's been through. They're getting his attention. Saying, hey, this is unusual, you know, to be this fire and not be consumed. Certainly. And um, later, even in the book of Exodus, do you know how God's presence is described? Okay, he has a column of flame. Uh, on Mount Sinai, he's going to be described as a consuming fire. Wait a second. What, what, what's he not doing to the bush here? Consuming it. Here, here we have a consuming fire who is not consuming. What, what kind of lesson might that be conveying about God and his character? It's not going anywhere. Okay, yeah, definitely. David? Again, thinking about fire being a refining, it consumes what is bad. It, it eliminates the dross. It refines. So his intent is to refine and, and to perfect, not to destroy. Certainly. Yeah, and, and you know, in, in the context of some precious metal, um, you know, certainly we, we see that very clearly, this refining process, burning off the impurities. Here you have something that, by all accounts and purposes, should burn up, but it doesn't. Um, I, I think, to a large extent, that, that's going to be a reflection of God's mercy. Um, and that's going to apply specifically to Moses. That's certainly going to apply later on to the people of Israel. When God is a consuming fire that, by all accounts and purposes, should consume them. And yet he doesn't. Uh, Carl, did you have a comment? Just wanted to point out that shows that God has absolute power, but it's very much under control. That's what uh, mm -hmm. He's the one who's controlling the use of his power, and he'll give it to whom that will use it for his purposes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, Joe, did you have another comment? I was going to say what Carl did. Okay, definitely. Um, and, and I think, you know, perhaps as well, uh, Moses can see himself as that dried up desert bush, <laughs> you know. Um, that there's nothing special about him. Um, by all accounts and purposes, you know, he should be uh, wiped out, and yet God wants to use him. Um, and God, in his mercy, is going to refine him, is going to use him as a, as a messenger. And so as Moses here in a little bit is going to say, well, who am I? You might almost think, well, God's speaking from a bush. Did you not get that? <laughs> like, you, you, you think that you don't have a mouth that can, can speak well? <laughs> do, do you not realize how God's speaking right now? Um, and so definitely, I think that's going to be an impactful, as, as, as impactful as that transition point of having murdered a man and having to run from Egypt is, this is the transition point that he's going to live with for the next 40 years. Um, this, this encounter with God. Uh, and what, what is he told to do here? And verse 5. Yeah, take off his feet. Uh, take off his feet. Take his <laughs> shoes off his feet. Um, why Why would he be told to do that? What, what? What's the significance there? The holy ground. Yeah. In the presence of God. You know, we, we might, from our vantage point, you know, think about, you know, when you come into somebody's house and you take off your shoes because you don't want to track in anything. Um... Because you, know, you don't want to get something dirty. 
he's wearing sandals. Do you think his feet are really a whole lot cleaner than his shoes are? <laughs> you know, not not really. Um, I'm not sure that's so much the point. What what what's the significance of that? Why why would that be an expression of coming into the presence of holiness? You're removing a physical barrier between your body and holy ground. Okay, being laid bare before the Lord. I think that that might be part of this idea, definitely. Yeah, symbols are important. If I take my shoes off, it means I don't plan to leave until I put my shoes back on. It shows I'm here. Okay, yeah. So, uh, permanence there? There's something that's, that's on sort of bookends on both sides of this. You have in the garden, even after Adam and Eve sinned, they weren't clothed with shoes, they were clothed with tunics. And then you see the priests going into the new Eden, if you will, the inner sanctuary before God. They're never given shoes either, they're only given tunics. So it's something perhaps related to the initial state of man before God, uh, at least in, in part of the picture. Certainly, and maybe part of that is, is the being laid bare before him, uh, Rick. Well, and we wear these shoes, these sandals, as we walk through the world. Uh, there's, we need to walk in a different way in the presence of God. It's, it's, it's different. Yeah, I think there, there, there could be some symbolism here of leaving the path that he has walked behind him. Um, you know, he, he's, he's been, had all this experience, you know, gained, gained all this, this dirt, so to speak, and that, that's being left behind. We're, we're starting a, a new path by God's strength and by his power. Um, so maybe, maybe some different things to, to think about there, uh, Joe. It's prevalent in other cultures and religion. I visited this, or Lynn and I visited Hindu Temple, Mm -hmm. The first thing they do is have you take your shoes off. Right. They have these tubes. You put your shoes in these big bamboo shoes. So it's showing that this is a holy place. Right. You know, you need to take your shoes off. Certainly. Drum to yeah, I was just going to call on Carl for a second because Carl preached a message on this. And I've, I've been trying to recall that. This is like right on something that's on the top of my mind about the holiness, like not seeing up under it, up under the tunic. I I cannot remember, but, but she preached an, an yeah, incredible message on that. The That's, priestly clothing, they had, had linen underwear, if you will, that went down to their, covered their thighs so that they couldn't be seen as they're going up the steps or anything. What I was going to point out, though, I, that you mentioned that, when the apostles were sent out to the cities to preach, they were told that people wouldn't receive them to shake the dust off their feet at those people's homes. As a, as a symbol against mm. them for not receiving the holy word of God. As they were going out from that place, they were to leave the dust of their feet behind there. Uh, right. So I don't know if that sort of plays into this whole image. So that um, imagery but, of leaving something behind right. see, seems to be certainly part of it. By the way, when we were talking about the, the consuming fire that doesn't consume, um, Acts 2 has the Holy Spirit show itself uh, by tongues of fire. Very, very similar imagery as well. Um, so... Uh, does Moses view himself as the right man for the job here? No. Uh, no, and, and we could read much more about that through the rest of chapter 3 and chapter 4. Um, but his initial response here, I think, does kind of sum up the, 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 uh, the attitude. Who am I? Uh, verse 11, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out. Forty years ago, he seemed to have thought that he must be the one that God had chosen to fulfill this rule. Um, he's, he's got all this education and this power and this influence. Now, who, who am I? Um, he goes on to say, well, if, if the people of Israel ask me, you know, what, what's the name of the God that sent you? You know, what, what should I say? That, that's a weird question because God had revealed his name Jehovah prior to this. It's, it's prevalent throughout the book of Genesis. It's, uh, you know, how the, the fathers knew him. Um, but it seems perhaps, you know, in contrast to the Hebrew people, how many years of religious education among the Hebrews did Moses have? You know, these people know more about you than I do. Um, M Moses had very little experience, very little knowledge and training about Jehovah God, the first three years of his life, maybe some exposure um, through the Hebrews from that point forward, and then 40 years of Midian, where perhaps, you know, uh, the priest of Midian is aware of Jehovah God, but it doesn't seem 
uh, you know, that he is solely serving Jehovah God. Go ahead. I love the contrast here. You've got Moses saying, who am I, when he was really somebody, according to at least at first 40 years of his life. But the response God gives is not a question, it's an affirmation. I am who I am. It doesn't right. matter who you are. Right. What matters is who I am. Right. And that is so true for us today. It's not the preacher or the pastor or whoever that's somebody. It depends on who God is. Right. And once we know who God is, if that person's helping us get to him, then that's that's what we need. Right. And and I think to a large extent, this is where God wants Moses to be. Now it's gonna to get to the point where Moses is is too focused on his inadequacy that that he he's uh, hesitant to respond in faith to the Lord. Um but Moses needs to see that it's not him, it's the Lord. And that's the entire point. Go ahead, David. I'm kind of taking off a total comment there. Again, if you contrast Acts 7.25, he assumed that the people would understand that God was providing deliverance by his hand. That was Moses' assumption when he was 40. Mm -hmm. Here, in Exodus 3, Moses... It's not registering yet with Moses what God is telling him. Mm -hmm. Because in verse 6, he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that made these promises to the people right. way back. In verse 7, I, God, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Verse 8, I have come down to deliver them um, out of the hand of the Egyptians. But verse 10, I, God, will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people. Mm -hmm. God's telling him, like Carl's pointing out, I'm God and you're not. <laughs> you didn't, when you tried it your way, you failed because I hadn't sent you. Right. I'm the yeah. one that made the promise. I'm going to provide the deliverance. Go. Right. And we'll we'll start here next time. We, we may very well not always get through our outlines. We'll, we'll just kind of go uh, however fast is, is helpful. Uh, so we'll pick up here next time. But, but let's just end on this note. The, the summary of Moses' responses to God is, who am I? You know, I don't know enough. I'm not eloquent. Um... And the summary of God's answers is, it's not about you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be with you. I'm going to equip you. It's going to be my words speaking through your mouth. Um, and so we'll, we'll pick up there next time. But we're going to start here. Uh, hopefully you've already seen some of the application to leadership as we think about it in our context. Uh, but we will start next time much more specifically talking about, okay, how do we apply some of these lessons to, to uh, our leadership? Um, and what